what did you do on Valentine's Day? Well, Deanna and I went away. We were, uh, uh, went away for a little break. We left Monday afternoon, and we we're going to come back Wednesday night, and we did come back Wednesday night. But we went over to the Yarra Valley, and we stayed in Hillsville. Anybody that's been paying attention knows that, well, we got there Monday late in the day, and then Tuesday at about 2.30, storms came, and the power went out. And all of Hillsville, for the next two days that we know of, was pretty much shut down, you know? So, uh, yeah, it was interesting. And that re actually reminds me, every time we go away for anniversaries or Valentine's Day, there's always a story, every single time. It's crazy. It's like, I, I think God's got a sense of humor, and he's saying, don't go away or something. Or maybe he just wants us to be quiet and not do anything except pay attention to each other because I'm really hard work to live with, and relationships are hard work. So uh, that gives us time to work on that stuff. If you... Understand, if you've been married for more than five minutes like these guys, you know relationships are hard work. And today I've got some relationship advice for you. It might be a little bit surprising, though. We're in the middle of a series to help us navigate a journey called Living Generously, to do that in our lives. And last week we found out this, that if we want to live generously, we need to trust God, be content, and do good. And that applies to all areas of our life and all of our relationships, but today, uh, if, you, if you missed that, by the way, go to our YouTube channel, go to our website, go to our app, and you can get caught up on that, and I would encourage you to do that because it will help you in your life. But today, I want to talk about another relationship that we all have. And just like money, or just like our other relationships, our relationship with money is hard work. It can be either miserable or it can be fantastic. And just like any other relationship, you have to nurture that relationship and work on it for it to work out for you and be healthy. Our relationship with money can be characterized in several ways. Some people are afraid of money and they don't want to know anything about it. It just happens in their life and they, they don't even, have, they're completely unaware of what's going on with their money. And that, that's their uh, take on it. Some people have a love affair with debt where they just want more stuff, so they keep trying to figure out how they can finance something else so that they can get the more stuff today, right? Anybody relate to that? You, you all have blank stares, so that's none of you. Praise God. All right. Some are collectors, and I, I actually call them hoarders, where they just save every bit of money that comes through their hands. And by the way, saving is good. We'll talk more about that next week. But saving can actually be a form of greed taken too far because we're talking about living generously and savers that are hoarders don't want to let go of any of it. Some view money as a tool to accomplish stuff and that can be both good or bad. It can be either one of those things depending on what you're using it for. Now when I talk about living generously, our minds go straight to finances and we talked about that a lot last week, but everything that I just said about money could also relate to your time. Think about it. Some don't want to talk about it. Let's just live in the moment. Let's make no plans and let's just go with the flow and not have any idea what we're doing with our time. Some are in debt with their time. They, their schedules are so overcommitted and they are maxed out. They have no margin and they actually end up in debt and disappointing people and wearing themselves out. Some are collectors. They collect all their time and do nothing with it because they want to just hoard it and they're not going to give away any of their time. We're talking about living generously. It includes our money. It includes our time. It includes our talents. When we talk about time, we can learn a lot about God's perspective on time from some first century uh, letters. In Ephesians chapter 5, it says, Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil, okay? God says we need to make sure that we're using our time well. We want to be wise, not foolish. Who wants to be foolish? Right, I see no hands, praise God. Okay, so we all want to be wise, so we need to use our time well. In Colossians, it says this. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. There's a theme there. 
God wants us to make the best use of our time. In fact, as it relates to people on the outside, people who aren't Jesus followers, and that could be some of you here today or some of you watching online today, you, they're actually watching us and how we use our time. And it says we need to be using our time wisely concerning those that are outside. In James chapter 4, talking about life, it says your life is like the morning fog. It's here a little while and then it's gone. Even the brief life that we have is from God and we have no assurance. You have no assurance that you will make it home today. I have no assurance that I will make it home today. Life is temporary. It's brief. Our time, our talents, our treasures are all resources that God has given to us. And this morning, I want us to investigate this question. What is your relationship to your resources? I said I'm giving you relationship advice today. What is your relationship to the resources that God has placed in your hand? If we go back to the early church, or the early church that's described in Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 4, again, we see some things there. Uh, they were a fledgling church, and they were figuring it all out. Thousands of people were being added continually to the church. And they had a certain view of stuff, the resources that were entrusted to them. They said this, all, or it says this about them. All the believers were united in heart and mind, and they felt that what they owned was not their own, so they shared everything that they had. The early believers did not see their resources as their own. They saw it as stuff to be shared and lived out in community. They understood that they needed to live generously. In fact, if they hadn't, they wouldn't have survived in the early church. And we can talk about that in another series uh, sometime. But the Apostle Paul was writing in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. And we're not going to go through the whole passage. You can do that in your life groups or do it on your own if you're not in a life group. If you're not in a life group, shame on you. Talk to Pastor D and she'll fix you up there. Uh, but uh, shameless commercial. Uh, Romans chapter 12. We see that everything that we have is from God. And in verse 1, it tells us that our bodies, we are to present our bodies to him as a living sacrifice. He gave us our bodies. Those are to be used for him. We are to sacrifice. And then our minds, in verse 2, it says our minds are need, to be, need to be transformed. We need to change our views, have transformed think, th thinking. Then our emotions, he tells us in verse 3, don't think of yourself greater than you are. Don't have a false view of yourself. And I would also suggest don't think of yourself as lower than you are. You are a person made in the image of God who he loves right? So be self-aware of who you are in God's sight. And then finally, in verses four through eight, it talks about different gifts that God has given those who are Jesus followers and how we use those gifts in service for him. All of those things come from God, and God wants us to give everything, body, mind, emotions, or our soul, our gifts, to use all those things for him. So living generously includes everything that we have. And there's a guiding principle that is an ancient principle that I want to share with you today that will help us get, our handle on, get a handle on how we can use all these things for good and for God's glory. In 1 Chronicles chapter 29, there's a story that's told about a guy called David who lived about 3,000 years ago. He was the king of Israel. And he had ascended to the throne uh, through some pretty difficult circumstances. It was a challenging life that David had. It was not easy. He had led Israel then through wars and through personal betrayal himself. And then God led them on a journey, led, David led Israel on the journey to becoming a great nation. All their enemies were defeated. They were now the world's superpower. And David lived in a palace. Everything's going great. And then he looked out and he said, hmm, I'm sitting here living in a palace. Life is good. But God is still worshiped in a tabernacle. He has no house for himself. So David took it on himself to say, hey, we got to fix this problem. We've got to create a house for God. 
right? And he built the, or started to build the temple. He didn't get to build it, but he started a campaign, a fundraising campaign, if you will, to build this temple. And he invested in himself. Some scholars say his personal investment was about $14 billion. Yes, that's billion with a B. And he opened up the national treasury and said, hey, whatever it takes, we're going to build this for God. And then he challenged the people, give, give, give. And they all did. And at the end, after they had done all this giving, they celebrated. And look what it says here in uh, verse 9 of uh, 1 Chronicles 29. It says, they rejoiced because they had given freely and wholeheartedly to the Lord. They got excited because they took up an offering. And they all gave freely, wholeheartedly, energetically, enthusiastically. And they made a party out of it because the people were giving. Now, I've got the ushers ready. We're going to have some buckets passed right now. Right. So, now, we do that through the boxes in the back and uh, through online giving and all that. You know all that already. But then, after they had this little party because they were so excited about the opportunity for giving, giving David prayed a prayer, and in that prayer, we learn some guiding truths that inform us how we should view our resources. Look at this in his prayer. He says, David praised the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly. O Lord, the God of our ancestor Israel, may you be praised forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the victory, and the majesty. David said, God, this is all about you. He understood that principle. Remember, David is the king, and the greatest uh, uh, superpower in the world is Israel. He's the king of Israel, but he understood it was all from God, and he said this even. He said, everything in the heavens and on earth is yours. Oh, Lord, this is your kingdom. We adore you as the one who is over all things. Here's the timeless truth that we can learn here, is that God owns Everything. God owns everything. Think about that for a moment. Think about all the stuff you think you own. Right? Did you catch that? I didn't say all the stuff you own, all the stuff you think you own. God owns everything. Can you get your mind around that? I'm still struggling. Right? And so are you, I can tell. Okay. God owns everything. David's perspective is that it was all God's, and they were just moving it to a new location to build a temple for people to worship. Then he says this in verse 12. Wealth and honor come from you alone, for you rule over everything. Power and might are in your hand, and at your discretion, people are made great and given strength. Again, no timeless truth is that God not only owns everything, but God is the source of everything. Everything flows from him. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about hope. Hope flows from him. He is the source of hope. Well, he's actually the source of Absolutely everything. That's what David is saying. Wealth and honor come from you alone. David was saying everything that makes life livable, everything that makes life enjoyable, everything that enables us to do anything, all comes from God. And I want you to think just for for a moment about David. David was a successful man at this stage of his life. He was the king, and he had won many battles, defeated the enemies, and had built the palace and all these things. People had watched David. As they're hearing this prayer that David's praying, they'd be thinking, I watched him. I saw how hard he worked. I saw how well he led. I saw the investment that he made. I saw him lead in battle. I saw his personal sacrifice for us as a nation. Now David is saying, only way any of this happened was God. Imagine that. To me, that is very humbling. Think about the people that you know that maybe have made it okay in life. Maybe it's you. And you know you've worked hard or you know they've worked hard and sacrificed and invested and gotten somewhere in life. If that's you, would you be able to just naturally say, you know what, none of that would have happened except God, but God. David says, that's the only way it happened. Then he says this in verse 14, who am I and who are my people? 
that we could give anything to you. Everything we have has come from you, and we give you only what you first gave us. Another timeless truth. God not only owns everything, he's the source of everything, but God provides what we give, right? So when you came in today, Pastor Deanna uh, uh, went through a little segment there where we talked about giving and how we do that, and you made a choice, or you made a choice through the week, or maybe you're one of those set it and forget it kind of people, so you don't even think about it anymore, but we make a choice to give from the stuff that we have. Well, David said, God provides what we give. He provides what we give. His view was that it wasn't even worthy. He wasn't even worthy to be generous. He couldn't even call himself generous because it all came from God to start with. And he says this in verse 16. O Lord, our God, even this material we have gathered to build a temple to honor your holy name comes from you. It all belongs to you. Are you getting it? Yeah, it all belongs to him. Even the material. I think about even this place. We've got a sound desk and computers and lights and all this stuff. God provided the material for all of those to even be made. It all belongs to him. It all belongs to him. The material that I'm standing on right now that built this platform, it all belongs to him. The seat you're sitting in, the material for those things, all belongs to him. I don't know about you, but that, that's just boggling my mind as I think about it, that it all belongs to him because we work hard and we invest and we build things with our hands and all of that. And we give our money, but it all belongs to him before we ever gave anything. That's just amazing to me. You know, we don't generally have that perspective. Uh, rich people don't have that perspective. Remember last week I made sure you understood we're all rich. And if you missed that message, go back and listen to it because you are. We're all rich. And we usually don't have that perspective that it's all God's. And many, if they do decide to be generous with their riches, they want to be recognized for it. There's buildings with people's names on them. And there's actually churches that uh, back when they had pews, Pews are like hard wooden things that people would sit on for three hours and not complain, right, because the service was going too long. And, but they would put a little sticker or a, a, a brass plate, actually, on the back of those things, say, donated by Joe Smith or whatever. No, I'm not talking about you, Joe. Oh, he's over in Kidsmen today. Um, Joe Smith is a normal name but, or a random name, but anyway, we have one. <sighs> Where was I? Yeah, the wooden pews that you're sitting on. You know, People have that perspective. When they give, they want to be noticed sometimes. But David said, who am I that I'm giving you anything? Who are these people that were giving you anything? It all was yours to start with. So if it's all God's anyway, then when it comes to giving our time, our talent, our money, we need to answer this question. How much of my money will I give? Have you ever asked that question? You know, when we ask that question, some people uh, like to start with a principle called tithing. And if you're not a church person and you haven't heard that word, a tithe simply means a tenth. Some people like to start with a, that principle that I'm going to give 10% of everything back to God. I'm going to give him 10% of all of my income and, and give that back to him. And it's a great principle, it's a great starting point, and I would encourage you, if you're not in the habit of giving, uh, maybe start there. I, I would also suggest to you that you do it out of a heart of gratitude, not thinking it's a legal requirement from the law or anything like that, but do that as an offering back to God. But I think we need to think through this whole 10% or whatever percent we decide to give to God, because if you think about it, if I give 10% to God, that can foster a mentality that I've given God his, this 90% is mine. Right? That just makes sense, doesn't it? Well, when we talk about everything being God's, then we need to think through what we do with that other 90% or 80% or whatever percentage you've decided to keep. If I give God 10%, then I can keep the 90 and do whatever I want with it. You know, God provides everything. So how much should I give is actually the wrong question. A better question is this. Not how much of my money will I give, but how will I use the resources he provides to honor him? A hundred percent. How will I use all that? Now, I'm not saying give a hundred percent of everything you have to the church. 
I haven't said give anything to the church. I'm saying give it to God. But I'm not saying give it all away. You have bills to pay. And if you don't pay your bills, you won't have power. And even if you do pay your bills and there's a storm, you won't have power. (laughs) If you don't pay your bills, you won't have a home to live in. You won't have food to eat, things like that. So don't take this to an extreme. I've had people take this to an extreme and they say, well, I'm just going to give everything back to God and I'm going to sit and wait for his blessings. Well, he just gave you some of those blessings and he meant for you to actually take care of some things with that. But how will I use the resources, not just the money, but the time and my talents to honor him? To help us understand this a little more clearly, I want to tell a story that's uh, captured for us in Matthew chapter 25 in our New Testament. And it's a familiar passage, so I'm not going to read it, but I'll tell you in a nutshell. Matthew chapter 25, 14 to 30. There's a man, and the man in the story represents God. And the man was going on a trip, and before leaving, he gave his servants his money to take care of. And he had three servants. He gave one of them Five bags of silver, another one two bags of silver, and another one one bag of silver. He says, hey, I want to entrust my stuff to you while I'm gone. So the guy with five bags went and he doubled the money. He invested it, did some great, wonderful entrepreneurial kind of stuff, and he doubled the money. The second servant who had two bags did the same thing, went out and he doubled the money. The the one that had one, though, went out and he buried that bag in the dirt. So then the owner comes back and the guy who had doubled the five came to him and said, hey, here's your five and here's five more. Look what, look, look, what, look what we did here. That's a great investment. And the owner said, I am so excited about that. I'm happy with that. And actually, I'm gonna trust you with a lot more later. Then the guy that had two bags came up to him and said, same thing. Here, here's your two. I got you two more. The owner was thrilled and said, hey, I'm gonna trust you with a lot more later. And the guy that had the one who went and buried in the dirt, when the owner came back, he went and he dug it up and brought him this dirty bag of money back and said, here's your money back. I was afraid because I know you're a hard man. And I know that you would be upset if I lost your money. And the owner said, you're a wicked servant. You could have at least put it in the bank and got some interest. As we think about that, what's the point of the story? What percentage of the man's money was his money? You can answer. All of it, 100%, okay? What percentage of the money was the servant's money? Okay, guys, this is group participation, (laughs) all right? It's not just a conversation for Daniel and I, all right? If 100% was the man's money, how much percentage was the servant's? Zero. Good job. Right. It wasn't that hard. And it wasn't a trick question. See, the servants were not owners. They were managers. They were given the responsibility of managing someone else's money. And that, my friends, is the lesson for us today. Here it is. We are not owners. We are stewards. We don't own anything. We steward what God has given us. He He owns everything, he provides everything, and is the source of everything. So God entrusts money to us, he entrusts time to us, he entrusts gifts to us. He wants us to take care of them on his behalf. In the big picture, you and I are only managers of these things. One more way to help you get this. Some of you that uh, have a little bit of money may have a, a financial advisor, right, I, I don't, other than my wife. Um, she, yeah, takes care of all that for me. Um, but if you have a financial advisor, you entrust that person to manage your money. You assume that he has better contacts or she has better contacts and better information about investing and all that. And you give them that money and you direct them and say, here's the outcomes I want. And you let them take care of it for you, right? Am I speaking foreign language? You understand this, right, this principle? All right, so at the end of the year, you have a meeting with your financial manager, okay? And he or she comes to you and they say, okay, hey, 10% of your money I invested over here and I doubled that bit. That that was really, really good outcome. (coughs) 
But I also needed a new car for myself. I needed a holiday home because, you know, the home I've got here, is, that's not enough. You've got to have a holiday home too. So I took part of your money, and I bought those things for myself. And then that, that took up about half of your money by the time I did the 10% and then buying all this stuff for myself. The other 50%, I actually don't know what happened to it. I put it in this miscellaneous category, right? Is that person your financial manager next year? I think not. I think not. And if they are, I want to be your financial manager, uh, right? That sounds like a great gig. Bringing this back to us, we are not owners. We are stewards. As stewards, I want to suggest to you today, as managers, we need to be doing this. We need to be knowing where it's all going. We need to be knowing where it's all going. If you're a steward, if you're a manager of someone else's resources, we're talking about God's resources, you need to know what's happening with those resources. If I asked you today to tell me how you spend your money, some of you could give me spreadsheets and reports, and I'd be like, whoa, okay, I didn't want to know that much information. But some of you would say, I don't know. I got no idea where my money goes. It comes in and it goes out, and it's just done, that kind of thing. We all need a plan to track what's going on for our money, but also with our time. If I asked you to account for, for your time over the last week, how would you feel about that? It might tell me it's none of my business, and maybe it's not. But how would you feel personally if you had to track your time for yourself? Would you see it was invested wisely? Or would you say, wow, I wasted a lot of time. Right, right. Yeah, 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 you get the picture. So, why track it? I'm going to be suggesting to you today that you need to track things. You track because it's going to cause you to pause. If you're having to write something down that says, hey, I spent this money on this, you're going to pause when you spend that money. That's a healthy thing. It's going to help you also identify the reality of what you spend. It could be confronting how much you spend on yourself, or it could be comforting seeing how much you spend on yourself. The challenge today is to track your spending for the next 30 days. We're going to give you a tool for that as well, but here's the principle. Here's how you're going to do it. First of all, you're going to document it. You're going to choose a system, whether it's paper or whether it's, uh, we got a spreadsheet on the website I'll show you in a minute, or whether you get an app or however you do it, you're going to track it for 30 days. You're going to document it. Then you're going to examine your document. You're going to say, okay, that's what I did. And then you're going to decide how you feel about it. You're going to be evaluating, and then if you're not happy with it, you're going to adjust it. How's that sound? Does that sound like fun? It doesn't sound like fun, but does it sound like it might be good for you? Does it sound like it might be good for me? Here's, uh, if you go to our website, you can find these documents to, to help you out. Wherebebaddest.org.au slash resources. We have one that says, how am I spending God's money? That's what we put up at the top. Right, right? So now every time you have a latte or whatever, you can say, yep, I had a latte with God's money. That's great. And then, how am I spending God's time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So my challenge is for you to do that for the next 30 days. Some of you won't do it. Some of you just waiting to get out of here and say, that's just silly. I'm not going to do that. And maybe you've got a handle on all this stuff, and you already manage the resources God has given you well. But if you don't, and you might also be sitting there thinking, well, this isn't very spiritual. This is one of the most spiritual things you'll do in your life is being a good steward of the resources God has entrusted to you. Summing up, we're not owners. We are only stewards. God is the owner. He's entrusted a lot of resources to us. We are a blessed people. We need to ask, how are we going to manage what God has entrusted to us? How will I use the resources he provides to honor him? That's not the how much will I give God question. That's the how am I going to use all of it to honor him. And then finally, we need to start today by knowing where it's all going. Father, thank you for what you teach us in your word that's so practical for life. Lord, I pray today for everyone here that, uh, that's heard this. And Lord, even people who aren't followers of you can benefit by realizing that 
there's some principles in your word that can make our life better, that can make our financial situation better, that can make us better at managing our time. But Lord, we do acknowledge that all this stuff comes from you and we ask you to help us as we evaluate how we use the resources that you've given us. Help us to see our whole life as yours and help us to honor you with how we use it. In Jesus' name, amen.